I'm Emily Hayes, senior writer for the publication Script here at the Biotech Showcase in San Francisco. And I'm here talking to Joseph Basagana Riera. Thanks for having me. And he is the CEO of Landos Biopharma in Virginia. Uh, Joseph, can you start by talking about the, a little bit about the history of the company in terms of the roots in advanced computing? Yes, absolutely. So, Landos was founded uh, with the objective to develop safer and more effective oral therapeutics for autoimmune disease. And we are taking a very different approach. We have uh, built an advanced computational capability, uh, for instance, high resolution models of the gut immune system that allow us to test those drugs in silico even before we test them in animals or in humans. So the advanced analytics and computational modeling is a key driver of the initial steps of Landos Biopharma. It allows us to incorporate efficiency and speed. In addition, it allows us to incorporate precision. We are focusing on pathways uh, that are in the interface of immunity and metabolism. Those are uh, complex and dynamic pathways. And the advanced computational capabilities provide a unique advantage in studying what are the best pathways to modulate pharmacologically uh, in the context of autoimmune disease. What is your lead candidate and where are you in development right now? Our lead candidate is BT11. And it, it hits three check boxes in uh, what we call the holy grail of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. It's an orally active, gut restricted, with very limited systemic exposure molecule. It targets a novel mechanism of action called lanthionine synthetase C2, one of those pathways in the interface of immunity and metabolism. And it acts as a double barrel shotgun. It activates anti-inflammatory responses characterized by regulatory T cells and it suppresses pro-inflammatory responses. Uh, BT11, in a matter of 18 months, has advanced from the preclinical stage to filing to INDs to completing phase one clinical testing. In fact, on Monday, we released the final phase one data showing that BT11 is very safe uh, in cohorts in doses tested uh, ranging from seven milligrams per kilo, which is the effective dose, to 100 milligrams per kilo, which means that it provides a huge safety margin. Uh, comparing the adverse events of placebo versus any doses of BT11, we saw no differences. So it's a very benign profile. Looking at some of the problems of other drugs that are in the market for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, systemic immunosuppression is an issue. And one of the manifestations of that systemic immunosuppression is white blood cell counts. We found that BT11 did not decrease white blood cell counts, uh, so we are very pleased. And then in terms of uh, an initial signal for efficacy, we look at uh, biomarkers of inflammation and particularly look at fecal calprotectin, which is a marker of intestinal inflammation. And we saw that uh, fecal calprotectin levels uh, in those subjects treated with BT11 were reduced when compared to placebo. So we are very excited. We feel that uh, we answered the questions in regards to safety and we are ready to advance to a phase two program in this Q1 of 2019. And why is it so important to have an oral drug for these diseases? The, the oral administration provides a convenience factor. Now, current drugs in the market, very popular drugs, TNF-alpha blockers, often require an IV infusion. It requires going to the hospital. That disrupts the life of that patient and also of uh, the families of those patients. We believe that an oral drug is uh, the right answer to be able to address this unmet clinical need. And if you combine the oral activity with the fact that this drug has the potential to be safer and more effective than other drugs, it, you have then a, a potential blockbuster. What are your thoughts about some of the failures in the space for recently developed molecules? Yeah, I think um, the, the first thought is to learn as much as we can about those failures and make sure that we are not following that path. Uh, we've been following, the, um, uh, obviously, the Morganson failure about two years ago, uh, drug targeting SMAT7. We were skeptical about that drug because it's an oligonucleotide, and it's really hard to deliver enough of that oligonucleotide in the distal parts of the gastrointestinal tract when the gastrointestinal system is designed to destroy oligonucleotides. The same thing with uh, oral peptides. There are several oral peptides that are currently in development targeting um, IL-23, uh, integrins. Well, the gastrointestinal tract is designed to destroy those proteins, those peptides. And so um, the lesson learned from those failures is uh, before moving to phase two, one needs to understand really well the PK-PD relationships. Uh, 
we need to understand really well that the drug actually makes it in the distal parts of the gastrointestinal tract and it has activity. And we've worked really hard to address that, not only in the phase one uh, studies that we presented on Monday, but also we did, and that's not very usual, um, we utilized a pig model of inflammatory bowel disease where we, uh, and pigs are very similar to humans in terms of gastrointestinal tract, translational value, immune system, microbiome even. And so we use those pigs to better understand how BT11 is distributed throughout the gastrointestinal tract. What are the doses that we should use for phase two? And we came up with those uh, pig studies in combination with all the literature of mouse studies that we had published that the dose of 500 milligrams and 1,000 milligrams are the right doses for our phase two studies. If we go beyond one gram, we don't see any extra benefit. So our phase two program is going to have three cohorts, a placebo, a 500 milligram dose, and a 1,000 milligram dose. And we are very excited to start it very soon. Can you address some of the challenges that, you're, that you might face in clinical development? Yes, uh, I think that one of the key challenges in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is the competition for patients, right? So there's so that it's a crowded space, there's many drugs in development right now, and uh, we want to be able to calibrate our inclusion exclusion criteria to be able to show efficacy because uh, all the preclinical data supports efficacy, but at the same time, we want to be able to recruit as fast as possible. So for instance, uh, we have had three clinical advisory boards in the course of the last um, 18 months. And there was discussion among the key opinion leaders, uh, gastroenterologists such as Bill Sanborn, John Frederick Colombell, uh, Fabio Cominelli, Mar Maria Breu, uh, as to whether the right strategy for ulcerative colitis is going after moderate to severe patients versus mild to moderate. And after those discussions, we came to the conclusion that the mild to moderate patients is the right decision that we should run the ulcerative colitis studies with um, uh, mild to moderate patients because that uh, facilitates faster recruitment. We can get up to one patient per month per site. And in addition, um, by focusing on that population, we are addressing an unmet need where there's no other drug. So there's at the very beginning, in very mild cases, 5-ASA, and then ulcerative colitis patients advance really fast to TNF-alpha blockers. In between, there isn't much that works. And so if we can capture those patients before they advance to TNF-alpha blockers, we have a unique opportunity. And in addition, we'll have our UC data sooner. So you were founded in 2017. What has the financing been to date? And can you up, provide an update on your Series B round? Yes. So we were founded in 2017 with a Series A uh, exclusively financed by Perceptive Advisors. And that was a $10 million Series A, which has allowed us to uh, finalize the preclinical work, file to INDs, complete the phase one studies. Now we are wrapping up a $60 million Series B, which will allow us to complete a dual program in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, will allow us to advance two other assets to IND and phase one clinical testing, and in addition, will support a basic discovery program, which will be the platform that will produce the next assets that we will be advancing to phase one and phase two. So we are uh, in the middle of uh, the race. We are talking with several crossover funds. There's a lot of interest. Uh, we did not reach out to strategics, but the strategics reach out to us. They, they find a lot of interest in uh, uh, the pathway, in the uh, intersection of immunity and metabolism, and they want to learn more. They want to possibly be part of, um, of this deal. What catalysts are you looking forward to in 2019? So um, 2019 is going to be um, a year of uh, heavy recruitment for our ul ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease studies. So that will be going on. We want to complete the majority of the recruitment for the ulcerative colitis in 2019. And we want to have initial data, at least for induction phase of the study, by 2020. But in addition, in October of 2019, we are filing an IND for another asset that is earlier in the pipeline called NX13 which is targeting a different target called NLRX1. We've completed all the preclinical work. We are about to start IND enabling studies, and we feel very confident that we'll be able to meet that October of 2019. Uh, 2020, I think uh, it's going to be a year that uh, the data we, re we obtain from the ulcerative colitis study is going to shape our path to IPO. If that data is positive, we have the potential to go IPO by 2020. 
What are your plans longer term for an exit? Now, um, we are in the process of uh, continuing to become an independent company. We want to build Landos. We've demonstrated that we are not a one-trick pony. We've demonstrated that we have a unique expertise in identifying pathways that others would not have been able to identify those computational capabilities. The, a lean and agile model have allowed us to, with a very limited amount of funds, $10 million, to get to the end of the clinic. I think that we can scale up. Uh, once we go public, we are going to go after additional assets and we'll continue to grow. So right now we are not contemplating an m and uh, or other um, options than the IPO. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much.